Hey team, welcome back to another episode of the Strength Game Podcast. I'm your host, Nick O'Brien, and this is episode number 61. The Strength Game is a weekly podcast dedicated to discussing all things physical culture with the coaches, athletes, iron enthusiasts, and experts deeply embedded in the strength game on both sides of the profession, both as coaches and as competitive athletes. I want to thank everyone who has subscribed to the show, who has rated, reviewed, liked, shared, commented. Your support is huge and allows us to continue to bring on expert guests and highlight more individuals in the strength game, just like our guests today. Also want to thank our sponsor, Samson. Samson Equipment provides first-class weight rooms and has earned an exceptional reputation of providing the finest quality, design, and customer service. Being a direct manufacturer, the team at Samson brings full customization capabilities and not only branding, but in custom equipment needed to execute your project. From racks, barbells and plates, to dumbbells, benches, flooring, storage, and more, Samson equipment is durable and made to order from premium grade materials, all built from scratch, start to finish. Samson equipment provides professional weight room solutions for all your strength and conditioning needs. See the Samson standard for yourself and learn more at samsonequipment.com. Also want to thank our sponsor, Cerberus Strength. If you're in the market for the highest quality strength and conditioning gear and equipment, be sure to use promo code strength underscore game at checkout to receive 10% off your next order at CerberusStrength.com. And in this week's episode, I am joined by Alec Olson. Alec is an assistant sports performance coach at Western Oregon University, where he directs all aspects of performance for the women's volleyball, track and field, women's basketball, and men's soccer teams, in addition to assisting with all other sports. Olson began his coaching career at his alma mater, Western Oregon, as a student intern coach before returning in 2020 at a full-time capacity. Before that, he was a graduate assistant coach at Illinois State for two years, and he was an intern strength coach for the summer of 2020, working with the University of Iowa football team, as well as a personal trainer at Fitness Experience in Oregon. Olson was a three-year letter winner for the Western Oregon University football team. Currently, he competes in Olympic weightlifting with personal best of a 155-kilo clean and jerk, a 120-kilo snatch. On top of his weightlifting, he also steps outside the weight room and starts to train in jujitsu. I'm excited to have him on the show today. So with all that said, let's get in the game with Coach Alec Olson. What's going on, everybody? Today I'm excited. I got a new friend and colleague. We got together at uh, the CSCCA conference um getting into some shenanigans and and uh <laughs> east west coast link up so we've got coach alec olson on what's going on today coach you know not too much how you doing hey i'm good i'm excited we were able to do this i know uh we got a little bit of lull on your side on the west coast so we were able to kind of link up and get to chatting uh i know we got a lot of things on your docket you just had a competition recently uh I just did, yep told me a little bit more about uh, your position and everything changing. So we get, we definitely got a lot to talk about. Yeah. Yeah, we do. We do. I'm um, looking forward to it. I'm actually excited to be on. Hey, so let's get right into it. Uh, I really want to know how you got started training and eventually kind of competing in the strength sports and what's led you really yeah. to Olympic weightlifting specifically. Oh man, this is going to take like 30 or 40 minutes. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> so how I kind of got started into it was uh, play football at Western. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say I, I played. I might have played like in a game or two at home because um, uh, I'm, the, I'm the classic way better in the weight room than I am on the field type deal. So I was really good in the weight room. But uh, so when I stopped playing, um, uh, I uh, wanted to stay around. I wanted to keep lifting weights and I didn't want to go to the rec center. So I asked my, my boss now. Uh, my coach at the time, Coach Corey Metzger, I'm like, hey, if I help you in the weight room, can I, um, can I lift and still train? And she's like, yeah, absolutely. So uh, I stayed around, helped out, kind of like interned um, and lifted. I uh, kept doing that. And then I realized like, wait, this is a job. 
like you do this as a career it's kind of dope so uh that kind of what sparked my uh passion kind of to get into um strength conditioning sports performance uh and then i kept lifting and then i <laughs> i dated a girl at the time um she was her name's amy i don't know her last name is now but um anyway so she was a weightlifter she like interned at oregon state and everything but uh she was a weightlifter and uh she kind of got me into it because she was a thing. I'm like, oh, like I want to kind of do what she does because I'm not competing in football and I want to do something still. So she kind of got me into it, coached me a little bit, and that's kind of kind of how I got the ball rolling um, for doing like Olympic lifting. Um, so like kind of, she's one that got me into that, and then I kept rolling through there, um, and then finally kind of took it serious. I think after I graduated in 2015, yeah. And I kind of started getting more serious into it and then it kind of blossomed to what I'm doing now. So that's uh, kind of my history there on uh, how I got started in the training. Right. But that's a, that's a good yeah. sneaky way to stay in the varsity weight room for sure. Oh, I mean, yeah, it, it was, <laughs> yeah. So I, yeah, I, did, I didn't really want to leave. Cause I mean, one, I didn't want to go to the rec cause you couldn't do everything that you could do in here like you couldn't put a bar over your head and if you did you had to have like the inside the rack and have the safety pins up i'm like well how can i clean and jerk i can't like it's impossible so and then you like, couldn't really drop the weight which is annoying which I, okay i understand because like where the weights are in our rec center is it's on the second floor so if you drop it and there's classrooms underneath it's like boom boom so like you couldn't drop it so i understand that um but yeah i kind of yeah sneakily got my way into being an intern kind of and then uh yeah I kept rolling on that and just yeah it's and that's like that's the thing like it keeps me competitive like football does like football did kept me in something got gave me like a goal to train for because like it's funny I find like bodybuilding or anything like that to be kind of like monotonous and boring um and I mean if I was competing it'd be a different story but you know weightlifting it gives me like a finite goal like okay you know I want to cleaning jerk 155 or I want to snatch 120 and so you just rework for it work for it you find the technique is issues that you have you subtly work on it and so on and so forth and so it kept me engaged kept me going and um yeah, that's what I really fell in love with it and just kept rolling with it on that one but uh yeah I like it hey so from there and obviously anybody that uh Anybody is thinking about planning and putting a weight room together. Uh, the second floor is the dumbest thing you could possibly do. Um, not, yeah, not a good yeah. idea. Yeah. Shout out to, <laughs> shout out to my old Loyola weight room and uh, my buddy over there, coach Manning, uh, dealing with it on the second floor. Awesome. Awesome architectural planning on that part. Um, <laughs> hey, but from there, from there, that kind of, like yep. you said, it sparked your interest, obviously competing and trying to find mm -hmm. a new outlet, like athletically, after football and even even like during football obviously you said like um like the weight room was really where you kind of found your passion and where you like really enjoyed it more yeah. when did when did that kind of shift a little bit more towards the coaching side I know you were kind of in the room with your now boss but like former coach at the time but when did that mm -hmm. really the wheels start turning a little bit more to the point where Hey, I can really do this as a career. Like what's the next step? Where do I go from here? Yeah. Um, so I mean, when I got done, cause like when I finally was like interning with Metzger at first, I was like a junior, oh, senior, but I did a fifth year. So I was so far along my career track, but, um, kind of off subject, but like I got out of it and like, want, like I started helping out at high school to coach football with, one of my former coaches and that's where kind of like the coaching thing kind of sparked where like I kind of you know I'm decent at coaching and instead of doing the sports side I like the I obviously like the Olympic list and I like the list so I'm like I'd rather coach that and that's sure like you do a good job at teaching it and coaching it even though I was probably terrible at the time but um <laughs> uh you know so that's where it kind of got the wheel spinning to kind of start coaching um and I thought for the career path now kind of like next steps like I knew I had to be like you know the steps are you know you got to intern GA and then get it hopefully a full-time um, or part-time so uh let's just say that um I, <laughs> I didn't 
or I like to go out on Saturday and Friday nights a little bit more than I like to hit the books. So my grades weren't stellar uh, when I graduated in 2015. Um, I mean, that's where I could graduate. Well, it wasn't great. So not good enough to get into grad school because I mean, like you're at, like you think you need like a three to a three two five. Um, so I got out of school, did do great on my grades, and then that's when, and when I got out, like I was a personal trainer at a gym in Albany, like where I'm from, because I moved back to Albany, um, and in the private sector, and I was like, okay, this is this is all right, but I didn't I didn't like it and vibe with it one because I hated selling. Um, and I know, like, as a strength coach, you're supposed to sell your program, sell who you are, like, all that kind of stuff, right? So kids buy in. But that's a little bit different than be like, hey, like, you should come train and, you know, get healthy and lose weight, yada, yada, yada. It's like, but it's going to cost, you know, 60 bucks an hour. And people go, whoa, can't do that. Like, okay, all right. Well, and then all they asked for was like, well, can I get, like, a starter program, you know, to get me going? And if I like it, I'll sign up with you. You know, me being stupid at the time, I was like, yeah, sure, no problem. Started around, like, a four-week plan. I've never seen the person again. They just take that four weeks that I gave them a Monday, Tuesday, whatever, and they just recycle over and over and over and over again. And I'm like, well, this is stupid. People don't like, people don't care to take, to really, they don't find value in it to a degree. Um, so I'm like, I don't, I don't want to do this. I don't like it. And like, I like the fact that in team sport, you're all kind of working towards a similar goal, right? Um, and training together, that team camaraderie, all that kind of stuff you get with it. So, um, and I realized I didn't like it. So I was like, okay. I got to go back to school. So I went back to school in 2016, no, 2016, 2017, right around, yeah, 2017. And went back to school, enrolled, um, did a post back. Um, and then I was like, hey, Coach Metzger, like, I'm going to go back to school. Can I come intern? She's like, absolutely, I'll take the help. So came back, went to school, um, got my bachelor's in exercise science within like a year. Um, professor here at Western, Dr. Armstrong, like, he helped me out so much. He, he cut off all the elective crap that you that you need to do. And so I just took the main courses and uh, got done within a year. Um, and so I kind of built it up that way. And then from there, uh, Coach Jim Lathrop had an opening for GA spot. And he call, uh, called Metzger and he's like, oh, you have anyone? She's like, yeah, I got somebody. And so I in, interviewed for it, got it, and then went to Illinois State. So, and then from there, kind of just kept snowballing and, you know, after that two years and went to Iowa and then now I'm back here. So, um, yeah, that was kind of the path that I took kind of unorthodox to a degree. Um, cause I went back to school, but, um, it's been a good, good journey though. So. No, it's definitely, definitely a different path than, um, than some other people have taken. Obviously there's no real direct route to get to where you want especially in this profession or where you want to go. And even with you saying it yourself, like everybody kind of understands that the route of it is like intern, GA, Mm part-time, full-time. There is some sort of way for that, but between all the divisions, between the locations, the conferences, all the different things, like just availability of jobs and all that sort of things, that path is completely different. And then, kind of oh, going, yeah. going back so that you can actually, basically you had to kind of take a step backwards and then realize you don't like the private sector and yeah. then get another degree so that you can actually get to grad school. Um, it definitely mm-hmm. helps kind of solidify though, that you want to do be in the profession and um, you kind of made every attempt to set yourself up so you could get to yeah. that next step, which is pretty cool. And now kind of working back at your alma mater and like, Pretty yep. close to your hometown, which has got to be pretty cool then. Uh, yeah, it's, it's not bad. Um, I, I like it because uh, I'm really close to family. So it's just a quick 25 minute drive back home. Uh, so that's super nice. Um, also, uh, I'm not going to disclose how much I pay in rent because if, yeah, because some people would be, would scoff at me and hate me. And then my landlord found out he's like a really nice and sweet old 92 year old man. Um, you know, you might jack it up on me. Uh, but, uh, it's also nice because I can, you know, go visit my grandma and do laundry, but you know, cause I don't have facilities there at my place, but, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's super nice to be home. And then I also have a four year old, he's going to be five. So I can see him um, really whenever I need to, it's better than, you know, when I was at Illinois state, I had to like, you know, spring break off, go home, winter break, go home. Um, and so I only got to see him, you know, 
in certain chunks of the year, but now it's, you know, I can see him on weekends or weekdays if, if I'm free, you know, but. There you go. Yeah, just yeah. No, no Wi-Fi at the landlord's house, so came in came into work. <laughs> yeah, I, well, I mean, like I said, I had there's Wi-Fi there, and like you know, my TV gets it, so I can stream stuff, and I can do stuff on the computer, my computer. But I did not want to leave it to chance, you know, for this. So I'm like, okay, I'm coming to work, and uh, strong Wi-Fi connection, so we're good. But um, I mean, I don't have to pay for it, and it, it what I need it for, it does the job. So um, kind of comes included with my rent. So I'm good with it for that, but not for this. There we go. So, hey. Well, yeah. for, for me and the two people listening, that's perfect. We appreciate it. Um, <laughs> hey, so with your with your new role, kind of stepping into a full-time position a few years ago as you got out of your GA from Illinois State, um, mm-hmm. we kind of talked a little bit off camera before we started recording. And like, you're in a very unique situation, like not with, not with your position, like obviously like overseeing basketball, overseeing track and field and um volleyball as well but and assisting with football and all the other sports but kind of unique thing for you this year is adding a sport completely like yeah. with men's soccer yeah. and everything so uh you don't have to go into every single detail but um a lot of people are probably not going to get that especially in this day and age where the majority of athletic programs are in the in like cutting side of it like yeah. I, I got that mm-hmm. when I was at Fresno um, and we cut three programs, two of which were mine. So I've seen it on the reverse end, but for you, what's kind of the situation been now, obviously like there's only a few kids here, the program really hasn't started, but what's been yeah. like your initial reaction, like bringing a new program in and kind of taking them over for the first time. Yeah. I mean, the, the biggest thing, like my major concern is, uh, I mean, and my biggest concern is getting them ready. Right. So, excuse me. Um, and we all know, I mean, obviously you're at D1, pro, D1, so it's a little bit different. Anyone else is listening at like a D1 higher up where you can give scholarships. Kids have to come back. Like they have to come back to campus because, well, we're paying you and, you know, you have to be here. Whereas D2, that's not the case. So my big thing really is getting them ready to play. Um, and, you know, because most soccer, they report on the 8th. I'm pretty sure they're 7th or the 8th. I think they play within a week, two weeks. I know women's soccer last year, they reported they played that weekend. I'm like, okay. Um, but uh, so, but they, they team them ready, but I have eight guys on right now. Um, and we've been training for about like six weeks and haven't really done much like running or conditioning work. Like we've been doing sprint change of direction when the weather's nice. Like it's been weird. Like it's uh, what is it? May and two or three days ago, it was like a torrential downpour. And it's like, it should be nice spring weather. So I haven't really been able to get them outside, do sprint, change the direction stuff, you know, the stuff that they need to hit to then make them robust and all that kind of stuff. Right. So, uh, but we've been doing that in eight of them. I'm like, okay, good. Um, and then it comes down to, well, the old dreaded summer packet, but um, here's a quick plug, but team builder, uh, we have team builder. So it's like, uh, I'm going to prescribe stuff to get those to all the kids that are coming in. Um, but like the guys that have been here, I know they'll be decent. They know what I'm looking for. You know, they seem like good kids. They're going to get their stuff down. Now it's the freshmen though, or incoming guys that I haven't been with. That I'm a little concerned about because, you know, they need to hit certain numbers of a high speed distance, certain numbers of accelerations, decelerations, sprint work, like to become robust enough to where when they hit camp, they're not going to go from, you know, zero to a hundred within two days. And just all of a sudden hamstring, hamstring, ankle, knee issues, hip, whatever. Um, so that's my biggest concern really for them. And then my second one is, <laughs> so we have a weight room that's, if I look at it now, it's probably 25 yards long by 12 yards wide, depending on where you are. Um, if you go from like one wall to where our dumbbells are, it's maybe 13 yards wide, but they're bringing, the coach is bringing in 45 dudes. So <laughs> I'm like, okay. So you're telling me when they report, they're going to come train and it's going to be me, maybe, yeah, just me might have a little bit of help from my boss, but me with 45 dudes in a small weight room. And I have eight guys that have been with me and know what to do, but then a bunch of kids, that have no idea how I work and operate things. And then on top of that, you know, their coach only wants to go Tuesdays and Wednesdays and they want to go up 530 to 630 at night. 
because he doesn't want them to train before practice, which, you know, would be more optimal, but, um, you know, it's, that's his call. Uh, but it's going to, I, yeah, that second one I'm concerned about, I, I don't like, I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to manage 45 dudes, um, in a small weight room. I mean, it can be done. Obviously people have done it. Um, so I got to figure it out and I'll figure it out, but, um, it's just been a process. And I think, you know, the bigger one is trying to figure out what's going to work, um, how I'm going to establish what I want. Obviously I know what I want to do in the weight room and I know the culture that I want to set in here, but it's going to be, you know, managing that to a scale of 45 guys, because I've never had a team that big before. I mean, I, you know, a second, almost second year as a full-time, right? So women's volleyball is 16, maybe 20 women's basketball is, I think next year, when everyone's here, we'll have 14. Um, I mean, tracks large, but they're a, they're a different freaking monster, man. I mean, it's from what I've heard, like at the conference, track is different, just a different beast. Like, there's a lot of kids that come in for track at the beginning, <laughs> and all of a sudden you got 20. I'm like, oh, well, this is different. A month ago, I had about 40 of you in here. Um, but, you know, with track, though, they're pretty good for the kids that do stay consistent. So it's more like, all right, come in. You know what to do. I'll explain what we're doing. Go. Whereas men's soccer, it's a little bit different. Like, it's a brand new program, you know, because track has their own culture. You know, it's an individual sport, trying to make it as a team sport. Um, so I don't make it too structured and too rigid because that kind of goes against, to a degree, kind of their track culture anyways. And I don't want to try to shove a square peg in a round hole. Um, whereas with men's soccer – you know, it's a brand new program. So I need to structure exactly how I want you to work, give you kind of the, like where you need to be, how, how, what lift to do, um, how much rest time you should have in between. Cause like what I like to do kind of off on a tangent to a degree, um, like with my basketball team and my volleyball team at first I was, you're on me. You do this and that I'll tell you when to go. Don't go. And I coached the living shit out of them. Like be here, be here. No, you should be there. Like just work and work and work. Now it's got to the point where it's just like, yeah, head in, look at your iPad and go. I don't, you know, sometimes I had to with volleyball, I had to scale them back because we were doing like, like heavy, heavy squats and stuff. And they would do a squat. They do their like an ex, uh, accessory exercise or armor building exercise after the squat. And they go right back to a squat. And like they're two sets in and they're going I'm like, slow down, slow down. And so I was like, all right, we're going to be on me. Like, roll through and take it to the top. But like for all those teams, it's easy. Like I've coached them up so well, like they know kind of when to go, how long to rest. Um, and so that's all I got to do with men's soccer. But it's like giving up with 45 guys and be on the same page. Like I don't have to, send, I'm have to stand on one side of the room or the other and just look down and then hopefully know everyone's name and then freaking not have any music on. Because if I have music blaring, I don't feel like losing my voice in the first week, you know. Um, but, you know, those – that's what it's kind of been like trying to figure out a new program. Um, I know not a lot of, like you said, not a lot of people have that experience of like, Oh, we're adding a new program to the to athletics. And, uh, but it's been a talk here, you know, to add men's soccer for a while. Um, I, it's, I think from an administrative point, it's been to add students and a certain, you know, a certain number of students. Cause you know, if you have a roster of 30 guys and, they have friends and they're like, Oh, you should come to Western. I love it here. You know, if they can bring in one or two, one friend a year, you know, for four years, that's four people times 30. So that's a hundred, that's 120 students within four years. And you keep just, I don't know, you keep stacking and their friends like it. And then they tell, so I mean, it's a recruiting tool to a degree to get students. Um, and then I think it's, you know, we have a grass football field and we, we've been wanting to get a turf for forever. And so, and we have a grass soccer field. And so I think it's kind of like if we get them in another program in, we can kind of use that as leverage to then ask higher up administration, maybe even the state, like, hey, our field, our uh, grass fields get tore up. We really need turf. Can you help us? And that's like, oh, okay, yeah, they have three field sports. We should help them out anyway, with ways to get funding. But um, also, yeah, and then I think that's kind of the reasons why. But it could be right. really wrong. <laughs> hopefully, my uppers, up, people upstairs don't see this and take that out of context and fire me because i took them wrong but no you're good. We'll <laughs> <laughs> no I, I i think it's interesting um obviously i wanted to hear more about it uh we talked mm. about it but it's in this day and age like i said with a lot of teams cutting it's nice to see others 
figuring out ways to actually add in a meaningful yeah. way. And it's, and I think it's cool for you, like just listening to you go and, and kind of, you're going to, you're going to have 45 guys in. it's going to be a new challenge for you. It'll be, mm-hmm. it'll be something good for you to kind of figure out how to manage it, how to logistically make it work. Um, yeah. Kind of brainstorm on the fly because a lot of this stuff looks really good on paper. And then when you get 45 guys in the room, you're doing yeah. it by yourself. You have an hour. It's after practice. The, yeah. the it's a coach's first year. Like you said, track and field's got a kind of established culture. You're trying to teach them things. The rest of your teams kind of know what to do, what to expect when they come in to the point where maybe the freshmen and transfers are the only ones out of the upperclassmen or like the underclassmen that don't know how to do stuff yet. So you basically have a clean slate. The biggest wrinkle is they play in like seven days as soon as they get on campus. Yeah. It's, you know, and like, yeah, kind of going off what you said, it, it, it can be a great challenge for me. Right. Right. Like I remember when I, when I, uh, was my first year at Illinois state, we, when we went to conference in Kansas city, we stopped by Mizzou and we watched football go and they had breakouts, you know, accessories up, upstairs, downstairs. And so they rotated through, but like, I don't have that luxury, but it, yeah, it'll be a really good challenge, especially logistically. Cause uh, we have like, for example, like I'd love to run one by 20. Right. You know, but then the thing is, well, we only have so many pairs of dumbbells and we only have so many pairs of this. And so it's like we have to use barbell stuff and body weight stuff and some dumbbell work. But, yeah, it'll be a huge challenge. And, and I'm I'm always constantly brainstorming. Like I said, I'll have to brainstorm on the fly. Oh, that's not working. So next time do this. Um, and but it, it, maybe it's just me, but I don't know, like, how you feel, too. But I hate when I have to change something on the fly because I feel like when they if they're, I'm like, wait, hold up, that's not going to work. And they're kind of looking at you like, well, what do we do now? And you change something, I feel like they're going, well, this, this dude's a dipshit. He doesn't know what he's doing. He's not prepared. I mean, I doubt this would happen. think, but I think that in my mind, like, God damn it, I had to change it on the fly. I feel like an idiot. But um, yeah, it's, it's going to be a good challenge. And then, like, yeah, like they play within seven to 10 days. And I'm just like, dude, like, I pray to God that you guys do the packet or do what I give you for God's sake, because you're going to get hammered hard, you know, especially the freshman, like high school athletics is a different beast than college. Like expectations are so much higher. And, um, you know, and then not to mention, like, I mean, a lot of guys will play at like semi-pro and do other stuff. So that's good. But, you know, some kids that don't do any of that, it's like, I hope you do the packet because if you don't, you mean a lot of trouble real quick. Um, so, but yeah, it's, going to be a really a really fun challenge and it is, I, like I'm looking forward to it, really am because I've always wanted a field sport because I come from a field sport background um and like figuring out court sports has been a challenge but I've started to figure it out more and more and more so excuse me but yeah it'll be it'll be good nice yeah that, that'll be a good start for you and everything and uh hopefully they actually do the packet but uh in <laughs> in the most people's case I think most strength coaches can attest to it uh, there's, there's a varied number who don't look at it, don't ever do anything or do yeah. it all wrong. So you'll probably get a mixed yeah. bag and it'll, it'll be a big challenge going forward, but it'll be, it'll be interesting. Yeah. Hey, so you talked about yeah. it a little bit, obviously mm-hmm. kind of with the logistics of thinking about how you're going to program for 45 guys on the soccer team. And then even with your teams now, and obviously bigger ones, like football probably get broken into groups Um, since you are pretty heavily involved yourself on the Olympic side and like competing yourself, does Mm -hmm. a lot of those Olympic variations end up being utilized in your program with your athletes or because of like facilities and everything too, does that make you kind of stray away from some of those movements too? Yeah, that's a great question. And I'm, you know, I'm probably going to get, crap for it but I mean I think it's becoming more and more of a thing but like I don't utilize Olympic lifts in my program at all um two reasons uh the first one the biggest one is you know opportunity costs it's just it it takes way too damn long to teach the movement like being a weightlifter I I coming from not knowing it to being pretty proficient in it like I'm not I still have a lot of work I can like a lot of work to do to become better but it's just, you know, and all I could say, like, to get what I need out of it, you don't need to be that 
efficient or that technically good at, good at it. I'm like, yeah, I understand that. But also it's my eye. If I see someone doing it like crap, I'm like, I can't just go, oh, well, just, no, I'm like, nope, got to fix it. Stop. Um, plus it's like, I don't, I don't want a kid doing a broad jump reverse curl. And then the, the weight's too heavy and it falls back. I don't know, like safety reasons too. Um, because like, yeah, like I said, the big one's time. Because for example, if I use it with men's soccer, we have eight racks in our weight room. So that's roughly six guys per rack, like five and some change. So if I have five guys per rack and it's just me and I put them on a tempo, like we're going to learn, you know, uh, mid thigh or power position, hang in my slide, you know, do that for a little bit, learn the technique of it. And then we'll work on, you know, catching it and doing hang cleans. Okay. So I have five guys per rack. I do my technical work. Let's say it takes 30 seconds to do technical work for the first group. Well, I have five extra groups. So that's two and a half minutes. I just spent on technical work. Right. And that's if everything goes completely smooth and guys aren't, in, aren't screwing around and whatever. Not to mention, it's like I have four other guys waiting. Yeah, I can give them like an easy extra, like a plank or something to do. Well, that's fine. Um, that's where they can't kill themselves. Or if I know if I give it to them, they can't really screw it up. But it's like if I want to get three sets done, you know, two and a half minutes for a whole group, that's, you know, five, six, maybe 10 minutes, if that, like around 10 minutes, if everything goes perfect, 30 seconds per thing. Um, that I just used on using technical work. And it's like, okay, well, maybe instead of doing that, I could just do, we could do extensive, extensive jumping, you know, or low level extensive single, um, uh, singular, single jumps, like not some, uh, sing, like single effort jumps, right? So it's just, you know, a counter movement jump in place, extensive or repeated in place, or a real simple one. And you could do like, I don't know, a box jump, whatever, right? Um, I we could do that. Oh, and then as I, I bring, like, as we progress and get better, okay, well, let everyone get to a rack, so they're double-sided racks. So then it's like, I can have three guys on one side, two in the other. All right, now we're going to do extensive barbell squat jumps. Because everyone knows how to jump, right? We can, you know, if we really want to work on teaching how to land, it's like, okay, we'll do altitude drops. So you know how to, like, transmit force, right? Take it and then trans use it to transmit. Um, you know, so for me, it's just the time piece is – is huge um so and then i already forgot the second one dang it but that's that's the biggest hurdle why i don't use them and utilize them um and oh, actually i touched on it is uh, it's just the technical aspect i'm i'm a, such a stickler for it and i'm like yeah i can get them to do what they need to do or get the you know quote unquote power development rate of force development out of it that we need yeah and can it look decent and not great yeah but to me it's like i'd rather you look really good doing it and because if it looks good more than likely it's going to be a good lift and if you learn proper technique over time then it takes care of itself but like you know i mean as you know we have an hour right so if my warm-up takes 10 10 minutes if i have 45 dudes i'll be lucky if it takes 10 minutes you know 10 minutes to do a dy dynamic of the blood flow on quick mob make some jump prep you know, I mean, it's a field sport in season, don't need to do a lot of sprinting, but you know, that take 10 minutes to warm up Olympic lift, teaching techniques and things like no, 10 to 15 minutes. Okay. Well, there's 25 minutes out of my hour, but then I need to get everything else in. So it's like, I, I don't know. It's just, it's just a time for me. It's huge. And then the technical aspect of it. So um, I might get a lot of slack for that. Cause you know, some coaches, are like, well, why don't you just put them on, like I said, put them on tempo or, Light them up and have them do this. It's like, well, I could do that. Yeah, it's a great idea. But if I for again, it's just me. If I if I was at like you know when I was at Iowa, you have five coaches, and then when I was there, we had six interns. Yeah, yeah, you can teach Olympic lifts all freaking day long. You break them into certain sections. A coach takes twelve dudes plus an intern. You know, you're good. You can fine tune the lift, and you can get what you need to do. But um, it's just me, uh, and. It just yeah it's the time aspect for the technique part is just not worth it it's just that i mean it's a tool in the toolbox to me really like i got i have okay so here's a good example i do use i but i will use on certain kids in certain instances um like i have one the girl she tore acl basketball girl she graduated but she comes in and lifts you with but i put in kind of a program like some jumps for some other kids that come and lift you know trap bar jumps like, well, I can't jump because my ACL is technically still torn. She hasn't had surgery yet. Okay. Oh, we can do a clean though. Just slide your feet out. Like it's not a jump. 
So she does hand cleans. Boom. Taught her real quick on the fly. She does it. I'm like, I, that works. So that's what I'll do. And I have some basketball girls that have some, <laughs> some bad patella tendon issues. Um, and uh, if we do any jumping, I'll probably teach them how to do a clean. Right? Because you're not technically jumping. Yeah, your feet have to come up and slide out. But that's not that heavy of an impact. And if it does hurt, okay, we'll do a muscle or a, a no foot clean or something like that. Like we can still do a certain variation. So I'll teach them how to do that within five minutes. But the rest of the team knows what they're doing. So I can take a step back teach them in five to 10 minutes and then go right back. And I know the rest of my team is already getting through what they need to get through. Um, whereas, you know, with, if, for example, men's soccer, they have never been in here before. And I do that with kids that can't jump. Well, then it's a, like chickens with their head, head cut off or well, I'm running around like a chicken with my head cut off. And it's like, I'm trying to herd cats, like, you know, got crazy, but yeah, it's, I don't utilize it. I mean, again, I love weightlifting. Um, and I love the sport and I love the movements, but to me in this field for what we do and what we need to do, it's not worth the time. Um, if it fits, I'll do it. Um, like, you know, like for volleyball, they do already, they are already do a lot of jumping in their sport. So am I going to jump them in season? Probably not the greatest idea, but if I want to do, you know, a loaded power movement. Okay. I'll, I'll do a heavy hang clean or a heavy clean pull. Sweet. Perfect. I'll t I can teach you that in five minutes and get it through real quick um, instead of taking the time to, you know, go through the whole sequence of the Olympic list. But I like yeah. it. No, that makes you know. sense. Um, I mean, who cares who gives you flack for it? Every, every situation, mm -hmm. every place is different. Um, I mean, as long as you're getting to the training adaptation that you want to see, like who cares what tool you're actually using? Um, exactly. I mean, if you, if you feel comfortable coaching, if you don't feel like coaching, that's fine. It doesn't really matter. Um, but I think the biggest thing that like I take away from it is obviously like you've seen Iowa do it. Illinois state has like a pretty big weight room as well. Yeah, like we do. Um, mm -hmm. you have, you have a different situation where you're currently at and obviously a smaller school, smaller staff, like you're coaching by yourself. That that's, that's a big thing people don't realize. And when you go to program, you have to program for your facility, you have to program for your team, and you have to program for things that you have the ability to coach. Like I can, you can put the greatest program together in the world, but if you, you can only be coaching really one person at a time, you can yeah. coach and project to a ton of people in a room and I can sit there and dictate things to do and I can be on a tempo and I can blow a whistle and I could turn the music off and motherfuck as many people as I want, but it, <laughs> yeah. I can really only like spew out cues and hope some people like get it. They don't really know if I'm directing it to them or not. If that's something they yeah. have to fix, like you really have to kind of make touch points, visually show people how to do it and then coach up someone individually. And Olympic lifts, like you said, are very technically proficient. And that's like, I've always had that problem like competing in like strongman and Highland games. When I get mm -hmm. to the point where like, I want to use like strongman events or something. And I know like how it's supposed to look. Sometimes I have to like take that movement away because of how ugly it looks when I give it yeah. to an athlete and Olympic lifting is by far the same because you see how good it looks and how proficient someone is because they spent years and years trying to perfect mm -hmm. those two things and that's what i tell my athletes all the time there's someone that spent 20 years trying to get better at two things and i'm trying to teach you these two things yes. in 20 minutes so don't be yeah. surprised when it doesn't look great um as long as we can do it safely like right. and whatever derivative it is or whatever variation then we're fine but if you if you don't have if you don't think the time is worth like the juice isn't worth the squeeze or you don't think yeah. you have the time to coach it or the equipment to coach it, like don't do it. There, there's no need to be yeah. married to it. No, absolutely not. And like, you know, and some people might go, well, you're not doing it to support to look pretty. You're doing it to get whatever adaptation. I'm like, I, yes, I get that. And the, but there's a certain way. And I understand that like, uh, there's a, like Greg Everett showing it from Catalyst Athletics. And you see like a bar path, right. Of like three different snatches from three gold medalists, I think in the Olympics. Bar path slightly different, but it follows the same type of pattern, right? Same on a cleaning jerk. Slightly different, follows the same pattern. So there's a, there's a way it should be done technically 
that's proficient to get what you want. So it's, yeah, I want it to look good, but if it looks good, I'm getting, I'm getting more out of it than what, like than, from what I need out of it. Right. If that makes sense. So if you do it sloppily, like a reverse curl, you know, it's not, you know, gliding up elbows out and back and you're pulling hard on the bar and anyway, getting under the bar and stuff like that and whatnot. It's, it's just, it's not efficient or effective in my opinion. Um, it, yeah. It's just juice isn't worth the squeeze. It should, it should look a certain way. Right. But again, there's going to be different variation between depending on who it is and what kid it is, but it should look a certain way. And you made a really freaking good point. Like I've, I've been fine tuned on weightlifting for four ish years now, four or five years. And I just got to the point which we can talk about this later, but like I got to work, you know, the quote triple extension, right? I just now got to the point where my hips aren't coming that far forward. I'm only like, and I have almost a perfect triple extension line and pulling under the bar. And I've been doing this for four to five years. And like, you think I'm going to be able to teach an 18 to 22 year old to get like that in 20 minutes over the course of the four years I have them. No shot. In my opinion, no shot in hell. That's going to happen. Like, I'd rather just, I'd rather just put a trap bar in the hands of them jump. Especially if it's someone, if it's a team you've never met, they lift yeah. twice a week. You get them in season <laughs> yeah. right away. And yeah. 20 minutes. Of, so 40 minutes a week over the course of maybe 16 weeks. That's, I don't want to do that math, but it's, it's not a lot. And no. when you think about like what your training sessions probably look like, maybe like two hours, like if you're going well, three hours on a meet day or something. Well, two, uh, two hours on a, typically on a Saturday, like if it's during, like during the week, hour and a half max. Cause I only have about two hours between in a window between uh, like, I just got done with the team and when a new team comes in. So, and I, I kind of tell my coach that like, cause one day he had me doing five things. It's like clean primer, a complex, clean and jerk, a squat and a pull. I'm like, yo, you gotta, we gotta cut some stuff out to get the meat and potatoes in there because I do not have time. And like, if it's a, in, if it's a bad training session and I'm screwing up and I'm pissed off myself, I have no time to come to my office and decompress for a minute. I literally have to change. I'm sweaty. I have to change into my clothes and go coach. And sometimes I'm like, it's funny because I have, I have good relationships with my athletes and so they can tell if I'm not in a good mood, like Wolf and everything, what's going on today? You all right? And I'm like, I'm like oh, something's wrong. And I'm like, I just had a shitty training session. Sorry. I'm like, not trying to take it out on you, but I'm like, oh, okay. So they get it. Um, uh, but you know, it's my, yeah, again, my training sessions aren't that long, but yeah, it's, I have a primer, the complex to take care of any issues. And then I have the lift itself and then any like strength, whatever movements inside of there. So it's, you know, that's how I get really good at the movement. And, you know, I don't have that time with sport athletes or sport athletes, sport athletes, field athletes or court sport kids, because it's like, well, one, that's not their sport. So why would I do a primer and a complex and then maybe the actual Olympic lift? You know, like I wouldn't do that because I'm not weightlifters. So, um, yeah. It, yeah, so, yeah, it just wouldn't work. It doesn't, it doesn't work to me, for me. Yeah. But in my situation, again, bigger broom, more staff, maybe. Maybe. Yeah, but, and you can think about that at a different time. But, uh, no, those are, those are definitely the – intricacies of what happens if you're competing in a strength sport and you're a college yeah. strength coach and, yeah. and those things that you kind of have to get feedback. What, uh, since you do, like you kind of bring it up, you do have your own weightlifting coach. Um, yeah. how, like, what do you see as the importance of coaches kind of having a coach like oh. to help you through that movement? Because some people we've had conversations with or, or along, along my career where some people like you see them kind of with a fixed mindset, if they're either competing or they're coaching and they don't seem to have like bounce ideas off anybody, or they don't have a mentor to kind of reach out mm -hmm. and see where those shortcomings come from. Obviously you haven't been weightlifting for like two, two decades at that point. Yeah, you're you're no, still kind no. of fairly new within the, within the coaching profession and the weightlifting profession, but what has kind of been some of the benefits of you having someone to like explain like what a collegiate strength coach setting looks like and then get the benefit from them actually helping you with your programming to stay competitive. Yeah. I mean, well, like the coach that I have, he's, he hasn't ever been in 
the field before, um, you know, so kind of to go off of like, with well, the benefit of me having a coach um, is, so a little quick plug, Heroic Barbell, Portland, Oregon. Uh, but uh, yeah, my coach is Joe Beck um, and he's been great, but it's for me, the benefit is I don't have to write my own program. So that's one extra thing I don't have to do. Uh, and then, you know, I send him videos every uh, after every session so he'll reply back to it oh that looks great or hey that's maybe a little wrong so tweak it for next time um so it's been that's the great benefit of having a, a, a coach that gets takes me through weightlifting is you know i get feedback from him from something that maybe i didn't see um, and i'm really i'm super stringent and strict on myself like i'll see myself do something wrong i'm like i an idiot like fix that like what are you doing um you know, and he helps kind of helps me guide me through the process. Like when I'm getting grinded down, when it's super busy in here and he's like, all right, well, okay, we'll have to take that down. Or like, don't like, you'll talk me through, like, don't, dude, don't freak out. Like, you know, it's a super hard, heavy training session or phase right now. Like, yeah, you're going to get beat up. It's okay if you miss a little bit. Cause uh, typically whenever I hit a deload and we go into a competition, I always freaking I'm firing on all cylinders, which is great. But uh, yeah, the benefit there is, it, like I said, is, having that extra set of eyes and then it takes stuff off my plate that I don't have to program for myself. Cause I don't, I guess I could do it, but, and then like, if, if I had someone else tell me to do it, I'm like that kind of that mentality. Like if they tell me to do it, I'm going to do it because they took the time to do it for me. So if they write it out and that's what they prescribe, I'm going to do it. Whereas myself, like, yeah, I guess we can skip that today. You wrote that, whatever. Who cares? Um, so I won't skip out on myself. So it's, that, it, that that's huge um that's really huge especially for how busy you know we can get uh at the program for myself i'm probably not gonna take the time or like oh okay i'll get to i gotta finish the rest of the program so it's my teams it gets late in the day and i'm like ah whatever i'll just repeat last week i'll repeat that so it's it's good to have that cycle of you know i don't have to skip stuff i will do stuff that's given to me right yeah that accountability piece definitely helps uh I, I've come to terms with that. Uh, sometimes it is difficult having like that self-imposed or that extra project of you creating your program. And even mm -hmm. though like we know our schedule better than anybody else and no one else really outside of college strength and conditioning knows what the day-to-day -day looks like or how much variance there's going to be when just one meeting changes time or practice yeah. goes over or there's a weather delay and a team wants to come inside for no reason like that. When we like meticulously plan everything, like I'm eating lunch at this time because I have yeah. three teams at this time, four teams at this time. I'm lifting in this window before a meeting before this, when one of those things kind of goes off and as, as strength coaches, we're at the mercy of sport coaches and athletes and everything else that happens at the school our schedule mm -hmm. is, is based off of them. So my yep. goal is to try to plan as much as possible. And I hate last minute things when everything they already give me is last minute. So I know, I know where that like, ah, oh, fuck, I'm not going to lift. I can't lift at this time, or I'm going to have to lift yep. at 8, 8 PM kind of thing, or I'm going to have to double down the next day. It's a, uh, it's definitely nice to be like, no, this is, this has to be done. Someone made me this program. I can put yep. it here rather than like kind of put it on the back burner forever. Yeah, exactly. Like I think prime example is, was it uh, Tuesday or Thursday? Tuesday or Thursday. I can't remember which one, but because football got done with spring ball. So they came in and lifted like, I think it was Thursday. It went Monday. No. no. Yeah. Monday. Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. And so that Thursday, it was like softball's in at 6.45. Women's soccer came at 7.30. Men's basketball at 8.15. So I was here to help with soccer um, and transition into men's basketball. And then men's basketball was 8.15, 8.30. 8.30 to whenever they got done. First football group was at 9.15. And my training time on Tuesday, Thursdays is because that's the only time I have is from like when men's basketball is in. So eight 30 to when I have volleyball at 11. So I have a good amount of time because football came in, I'd help obviously help out with that. So it's football came in another football. And then I had like 20 to 30 minutes. I had volleyball, volleyball got done at 12. Then I have men's soccer in at one. So I can't train then after men's soccer at two 30, I got women's basketball. 
So I had to train. Usually when I lift at 8.30, I had to lift, I had to train at four o'clock. And I'm like, damn it. But it is what it is. I, had to, I mean, I had to get it done. So it's not perfect, but it worked. Yeah, but I think it it makes it more of a priority when, like you said, someone's mm-hmm. riding it for you and yeah. they're kind of holding you accountable. You take a little bit more ownership over it because it's like telling someone your goals rather than just keeping them to yourself. When you make it, when you kind of make it more public, um, you bring more people in on it and you you really take ownership over it a little bit more because it means something. Because I don't I don't know what I don't know. I know there's a there's a term for it. And there's, there's a kind of feeling, there's a more of a feeling you get from more people seeing it out in the open. Yeah. But, but I, I know exactly what you mean. Like I, I get that feeling from programs or, or having someone like taking a little bit pride and ownership over it, but no, it's a good yeah. point. And I think, I think it's definitely something that other coaches should have, whether, whether they're competing in something or if they're just training or they just want a mentor for to bounce ideas off of as a coach. I think it's yeah. important to have along your step. Oh, absolutely. And like he, Joe's been awesome. Cause like, I'll, I'll ask him some things like programming wise, like, you know, what, what do you think about doing? Like, especially like throwers, cause throwers are kind of like weightlifters to a degree. You, you know, they, they have certain meets you want to do well for. So you pick them up, drop them down, pick them up, and then you conference freaking get them going. So I'll like bounce some ideas off of him for what I should do. And um, I'll take some of his ideas of how he programs and put it in there. So it's, that's great too, and especially someone outside of the, the normal, you know, strength strength conditioning bubble. So, yeah, really enjoy that part too. There you go. Hey, so how has like your own experience training and continuously kind of like fixing your technique, getting feedback from mm-hmm. your coach, and like taking that into your next training session or or competition? How does that really kind of affect your coaching? Because like it's unique in the aspect that you're not doing a lot of weightlifting movements, but regardless of the movement you use, like you're still learning cues, you're still learning positions Mm -hmm. and posture, and you're still learning like intensity and like how to execute movements. So how does like your own training continue to kind of bolster your coaching? Right. Um, that's, yeah, that's a good question. Um, so yeah, I don't do a lot of Olympic lifts, but I think more of it gives it gives me a better idea of like how they're going to experience something. Um, so the intensity wise, like I, I mean, I love tempos in the very first beginning of offseason because it gets you back into like, it forces you to be in this position I want you to be in. So, um, and then, you know, hearing from like, you know, my coach, like where we are in a squat, you know, how the setup is. So it gives me, I feel it. I know where it, it, you should be and how it should feel. So I, it's like, it gives me a better perspective where, you know, do you feel in this position? No. I'm like, okay, we should feel here and, and whatnot um, for technique wise. And then um, for intensity, you know, cause like when I, I did tempos for my training and it was, I think we did a three, two to stand up. Right. So you know, three, two, and I was doing it at 170 kilos and it, for five reps, three sets of five and it freaking sucked. But uh, you know, <laughs> when I do it with my kids, it's obviously not going to be that heavy, but and I posted about it too. It's like, you know, I do tempos too. You know, I know what it feels like. And I know it's going to suck, but you're going to get this benefit out of it. Um, so th- I think that helps me in my coaching a lot is knowing, but, and, but yet again, and I do understand that their sport isn't weightlifting. Like my sport is being in the weight room. Their sport is something completely different. So this isn't the end all be all in here, but I know, especially if they're not competing it's off season, I know, that this is how it's going to feel this is how it's going to affect you um and i think that gives me a better insight and perspective uh you know if a kid's like ah oh, it's just you know that that felt super heavy i'm like well it moved really fast or you, you know but it you know i understand though again like it might have moved fast and it felt heavy because i've had to happen to me happen to me before too like moved to squat and it was I felt like i was grinding on the way up my coach he goes like oh god that was fast oh it was that but i mean it just gives me better insight into that piece of it um i mean some cueing parts too help a lot um but again i'm not doing a lot of olympic lifts so i don't really use that any olympic lifting cues too much so but uh but yeah i think that's really what helps is me 
training hard for something and then I can kind of better understand where they're coming from. Um, and I kind of took kind of his approach to it. Um, if I, you know, I had, I do have a time, but I take my approach to where it's like, I don't set certain percentages and you could get into like that kind of chalk talk maybe a little bit later, but, um, but I've taken kind of his approach to kind of style of programming too. Um, so, and that kind of helped push onto my coaching. So. Yeah. I like it. Yeah. Obviously like being able to train in something and your athletes be able to see it, or you can tell them kind of, Hey, this is, this is what I do for my sport. Obviously there's not a complete carryover from one to another, and I'm not going to train you the exact same way. Obviously the soccer mm -hmm. coach, like soccer athlete that I am for track and field or, or volleyball or football or whatever your sport may be, but understand that I'm doing the similar thing and I'm training hard. So I think that gives me enough right to push you just as hard to yeah. prepare you for your sport. And no, I, th I think that's, it's a great way to kind of build buy-in, especially like initially starting your career and kind of being on the younger end of it, because mm -hmm. that's when athletes really kind of check you because they kind of look at your resume or they, they look at like what you've been doing for a while and be like, well, you don't really, you're kind of, you don't know what you're talking about. And be like, well, I'm doing this and this and this, and it's this immediate, immediate buy-in Yeah, a lot of times, yeah. or at least, at least enough credibility that yeah. they're willing to not just like hear you they're really actually like listening and that they understand you have your best interests in mind because you're kind of testing on yourself instead of testing stuff on them yeah and well i mean i technically kind of test on them oh well, yeah <laughs> uh i mean but like i mean most coaches will like they're not competing in a in a like weightlifting or something they can you know all right this block is two months away i can try to myself and see how it feels i mean i don't do that and, you know, because I have, I'm training for something. If I try it out, like I haven't done triphasic on anyone, like pure on it, but uh, if I wanted to run that, if I ran triphasic while I was competing for it, I'd be freaking toast. I wouldn't be able to train. So um, that's why I don't do it, but I've done enough, like enough heavy trap bar deadlifts. I've done plenty of heavy squatting or certain types of squats that like, I know, where like how that's going to feel i know if i prescribe this percentage at this for this volume i know how it's going to feel or how it's going to affect them to a degree because that's how it affected me um you know especially if they're not practicing at the time if it's just you come into lift or train then i know how it's going to affect you now if you, you know they're practicing and then they come in it's a little bit different i know like i should probably back off a little bit because uh, i know how it feels for me and it kind of was a grinder so then i probably need to back off like back off on them a little bit so I still get the same effect that I want, the stimulus I need, but they're not going to get buried. Right. Yeah. You kind of, you also, you kind of alluded to it, obviously like mm -hmm. not using percentages as often and um, yeah. kind of the feedback that you get from the athletes as well. I know mm -hmm. you're kind of doing a little bit more managing and monitoring the athletes with some like sport technology and like either, yeah. and like some almost just pen and paper, some rudimentary things as well. Do you utilize yep all those tools with your teams like across the board or uh, what's what's kind of like the barrier of entry as you introduce this into like your programming yeah so that's um that's, we can go off on a couple of things on this one this can be a long kind of section but yeah so i mean we have limited resources in terms of like technology wise um we have a jump mat uh do we have a jump just jump jump mat which is great um <laughs> Fly tangent, but when I went my first went to Illinois State, when I was testing like gymnastics vert just to get some the initial numbers on, I was using the vert tech, and they're like, "Well, Andrew was using the jump mat." I'm like, "Ah, jump mat, whatever." He's a crap out of jump mat. Took me like 25 minutes to get their verts in because I was doing reaches and touch, and it's like, why don't I just have them jump? It would take five minutes, anyways. So I like to just jump, jump mat. So I'll do wait. What I do is um, I'll do jump readiness, and I usually I just do it with volleyball and women's basketball at the moment we'll see how many guys on soccer i get uh because if i do jump readiness testing with one jump mat with 30 guys it's gonna take like i do we do it with football actually so it only takes about five minutes so it doesn't take too long so what i do is it's a seated the seated jump on like a 18 inch box so you're right about like knees all right 90 degrees hands on hip so you have no counter movement with it so it's just purely like a neural drive like how high can you get and i'll take it's in a google sheet 
their names are there, date, whatever. So on one column, I have the average for the jumps that I type in. I have a rolling average for the past seven days, and then I have standard deviation, and then I have my Z-score. So uh, when I get the jumps in, when I have the uh, – it'll show me when I get the aver averages and everything, the Z-score will tell me if, you know, if it's – at one, uh, you know, at before one standard deviation, it turns blue. So it tells me you're right with they're right where they need to be within the average. Keep the program rated. If they're above one standard deviation, so one to two standard deviations above their average, it gives me um, a green. It says, hey, push above. They're firing really well. Push above. Um, and then it, the next one, if they're above two standard deviations, it gives me purple, which is like, hey, be a little cautious. They're firing super, super well. They're doing really, really well. So Maybe we might be, you know, redlining a little bit, like to a degree where, um, the, you know, possibility of sickness might come along. Um, and then below that, if they get, you know, negative one to two, gives me yellow, like scale back a little bit. They're not doing well, scale back. And then if it comes up red, anything below negative two standard deviations, um, I'll pull them, just recovery only. And I actually, I did that a couple of times with volleyball last year. A couple of girls were in the red and I'm like, yeah, you're no, nope, not looking today. Like I put them on a bike, they did some mode work, and I was it. Um, that I've learned gets a shit ton of buy-in because they know that they that if you and when you actually use it, they know that you give a shit about them, and they're like, okay, like in some girl, like one other girl's like, come on, coach, I feel good, like I want to lift. No, nope. like you're like I took the jumps from like it was over a course of like two months. And I'm like, no, like you've been hitting this, 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 and this. Like you've been green a couple of weeks, and now all of a sudden you're in the red, and you know. I'm like, no, I'm not going to put, I'm not going to push it. We're in season. No. So I'm like, she was upset, but then she got it. Right. Um, so that's what I'll do uh, with those two teams. And I'll probably do it with men's soccer. We do it with football. Um, and I think it's a cheap, effective way to kind of figure out, are you ready to train that day? Right. So um, I like, and we do it before, after, uh, after a warm up, and usually our jump are jumping in the back room. Just, I know they're warm because when they come from practice is when we're generally going to lift. So, um, that's when I'll do our jump randomness is right after you come from practice, we'll jump. Where are you? Okay. We're good. Push. It's not pull back. The next one that I do, um, I got this from Scott Kewen off of strength coach network, uh, on his load monitoring dash on Google, um, on Google, uh, sheets. So it's a wellness score that I use. And, uh, what happens is, is I send out a form every day and it gives me their sleep stress, mood God, there's two more da, da, da. soreness and fatigue in the right right and so scale one to five one being bad five being good and i get that information in gives me a wellness score and then um and then i have their acute chronic work ratios on the same dash so like on the computer screen i see everyone's name a box and so what i do is i get subjective rpes so i'm like hey how hard is this session for training a conditioning uh practice and then obviously a game and it, it loads out into a graph. So it shows me load, but so I see where are we? Are we within that acute chronic where we're good? Are we in that yellow zone where we're be cautious or in red where I have to completely pull you because it's too much workload or so little that I'm, we need to push harder. So I utilize those two things um, to help with like, figure out, are you ready to train? Can I push, can I back off? And I try to marry the readiness with the jumps you know, so if it's like their acute chronic is perfect or right where it is, their wellness is good, but you know, they jump like in the yellow. I'm like, now really ask them, how are you feeling today? Feeling good, not feeling good. Um, like the example I gave before, her wellness was low, acute chronic was in the yellow, which is like cautionary. And since she jumped in the red, I'm like, yeah, no, you're shut down for the day. Um, so, and then, yeah, going off of kind of the programming like you mentioned before, I mentioned alluded to before is like, so my big thing, and I got this from Malden Janovic, Janovic, I can't, I don't know, I can't say his name, but he wrote Agile Periodization. So he made an example of like, and I really liked it. And I kind of put this into my philosophy and how I really do things is I pull the floor and I push the ceiling or uh, Dan, uh, Coach Dan John, you know, park bench versus, versus bus bench, you know? So, I mean, if you want to know what that is, so like a park bench is, you sit down at the park, nice day. You're kind of it's long for the day, kind of people watch, you know, hang out, see where the day takes you. Um, enjoy the process, enjoy the ride. Whereas, you know, bus bench is 
you know exactly when the bus is going to arrive, you know exactly where you're going, you know exactly when you're going to get there. And that's more of like, I'm going to push this. I want the stimulus. We're going for it. Um, or for the pull the floor, push the ceiling. I'm going to bring your floor closer to your ceiling. And I'll drive your ceiling up. And I just keep doing that over and over and over. Um, and I found huge, like huge success from it, right? So I'll prescribe for doing strength movements. We're doing threes. I'll go, like, I'll look at my relative intensity charts. Like for threes, want it to be like 82 and a half. So I'll prescribe 76%, right? So we're doing four by three. And I go, okay, first set 76%. Do it. How do you feel? I felt good. Want to go up? Sure. And I'll ask, well, how much? I'm like, well, five, 10 pounds. Okay. And then as, especially with like with volleyball and basketball, and like, as they've gotten better at it, I'm like, okay, here we go. So if you have an RP of seven or above, you keep the same. You know, if it's from five to seven, you can go up maybe five, maybe 10 pounds. If you're a five or below, you know, 15, maybe push 20 if it's super low. And so what I found is it's funny because they'll communicate with each other. I'm like, ah, that was kind of hard, but ah, I think I can go up. And they'll push each other like, you going up? And the girl will be like, I don't know. I'm like, well, I'm going to go up. And she goes, oh, okay, all right, I'll go up. And I found like our strength numbers just go, like just keep climbing and climbing. Like where if before, if you prescribe a certain percentage, and, you know, they're getting hammered or a big thing about it too is, you know, at that 76% for one kid might feel easy, but what's, you know, one kid, like they're like, they're mostly all women, um, you know, boyfriend broke up with them. Dog is sick and they have a final. Well, that 76% is going to feel like 95, like it's gonna be heavy for him. And then, uh, so it's like, Hey, you feel good. Like, no, this is happening. I just, I feel like crap today. I'm like, all right, well, keep it the same. You want to keep the same? You want to go down and or, like make let them make that decision. So it kind of lets them be in control, but they're not. Um, so, but I've seen like they'll add and we'll keep going and going and going, and it like it leaves it up to them and how they feel that day. And like we've I've, ha- I've been having ki- girls and just kids even at track like just make big jumps, and it's not massive jumps like you know trying to PR make huge PR numbers it's you know we'll add five ten pounds a week and then I'll set the percentage the next week and then I'll tell them like so for example if their max didn't change that much on team builder you know if their first set was at 115 but then the next week I prescribe it another one it's like well last week I went up to like 130 but it's prescribed at like 120 I'm like well then what was your third set like, oh, 125 well start at 120 125 how do you feel today I'm like, oh, I feel good start at 125 okay how'd I feel I actually felt really good. All right, what do you want to go to? 135? Yeah, I can do that. All right, go ahead. You know, and I kind of just let them flow and do that, right? So I found that way of programming very, very, very effective. And I've seen kids make massive strength gains. And like for me, also kind of alluding to like Olympic lifting and making things look good. It's like technique wise, you know, you start light. Of course, technique's going to be perfect. It's going to look good. Yeah, it's light. It's not that hard. But then when you start prescribing it and you start doing the push the ceiling or the uh, really prescriptive work with not, it's not loose, it's heavy. And the kids, they just start to like technique just goes out the window. I'm like, yeah, I don't like that. But whereas I found is like, let them kind of stack slowly up and up and up and up. Technique stays the same the entire way. And I'm like, this is perfect. So, um, and usually I'll do a, you know, pull, push the ceiling every three phases. So every 12 weeks. Let them feel it out, phase it, you know, keep going. And then, all right, here, like, and I'll, hand, I'll let them know, I'm like, hey, I'm prescribing it this. I want you to hit this. But again, I'm not married to it. So, like, if you're feeling really good and I prescribe threes or twos, whatever it is, I'm like 90 something percent, and they're feeling super good, technique's good. I'm like, okay, man, go for it, go up. That's fun. You know, but usually I try not to have them go down. But if they're really, really struggling, I'm like, okay, all right, back off a little bit. But it's more, strict prescription compared to very loose prescription type deal because you know in team sport and then we're humans so coach didn't know but they grind them into the dirt you didn't know about it until they come into the room and you're like ah crap so instead of prescribing a certain set and reps or not certain yeah certain set and reps and percentage scheme it's just like here's a set rep scheme just for one set and percentage and then we'll go from there and i found a lot of success out of it no that's awesome i think uh those open sets and obviously like getting a lot of feedback from your athletes and, and their input for a lot of things. And, and like you said, kind of pulling the floor up so that 
they're kind of confused or maybe hesitant on what they should do that day, um, but they've already shared information from them. You kind of have already vetted them and got some got some info from their feedback and what they've done after their warm up with the jump mat or from their wellness yeah. scores. Like you already kind of have a little bit of the picture. You already have the plan in place. And then they give you feedback. They're doing a set or two. And then they ask for your input. It's a lot easier for you to come up with a decision or not even really decision, more of a suggestion to them. Yeah. And then they they really take ownership over it and be like, I can do it. And then I think it builds even more confidence rather than you say, hey, right. do 135. And they do it. And they're like, that was OK. But you say, what do you want to do? And they're like, oh, I want to do 135. And they come back and they're like, that was good. Yeah, that's yeah. Then, then they feel like like they owned it, they picked it, and it's not something that's kind of being like programmed and dictated. Like this is what you yeah. do, and right. and then it allows you for to kind of ride those waves because yeah, you you have no idea what an athlete's going to be like after practice, especially or mm-hmm. or what they're feeling or what other kind of external factors are causing them stress. So you can't. It's really hard to program like hard percentages or like hard sets and reps and everything when you can't control a lot of those things. And even yeah. like, like as much as we say it, like yours is a division two school, but mine's a division one, like, e- like even in my setting, which mm-hmm. is, it's not a high level, like power five division one school yeah. or anything like that. There's no way I control a lot of those factors to the point where I'd say we're doing this percent, this percent, this percent everything it's open-ended there's ranges i'm trying to get as much feedback as possible because everybody's going to respond differently to it and if i'm in a really rigid system like that i'm just going to hit the bell curve people and it's and it's probably going to hurt the outliers or or do some sort of damage yeah like you you see kids that come in like if you set a a really hard percentage which i think like you know we all it's funny where you come from to where you are now when you look back at doing stuff I'm like god that was stupid but uh you know i've done that before and like kids were hammered i'm like no push, push through it you gotta do it you gotta hit it and they just are like oh grinding it out and then they're just like god this sucks and you don't want them to be like god oh, this sucks and with you because that's like at the end of the day and i tell this to the truth i tell this, I tell this to my kids too and i'm not trying to bash what i do at all right but I'm like, at the end of the day what we do in here is important right but it's not at the end of the day, it's not, I mean, it's important, but it's not the end all be all, right? This is to like mitigate injury best as possible, make you a little more robust, give you some physical outputs to then express out on the court or field, right? So to me, it's like, why would I want to, if they're getting grinded or they're getting pushed hard at practice, or whatever, then if I'm going to do, like, obviously I'm going to match my, like I do high, low, I match it. But if I'm going to force you into stuff and then you're just getting grinded in here, grinded in there, you're like, God dang and they're not having a lot of fun and it's it's it take i think it takes away from the experience so to me it's you know having a lot of those open sets and then you know one phase where it's four weeks hey we're gonna push and i'll let them know we're going to push just fyi it's going to be hard and they're like okay and they understand that we're, we get after it but uh and then after that it's open it's open-ended um but yeah it's it's tough because like i said we did we can't manage a lot of stuff and like kind of a to go off on a little bit of tangent like uh i try to implement like um uh, like a high performance type model or like uh just basically like try to take down silos between sport coaches and in here and sports med where i mean here it's hard with sports med because we have <laughs> we have one of our ats has softball baseball women's volleyball women's basketball did i say volleyball yeah uh Basically, every women's soccer, men's soccer. She has six teams. We have one person for track and field that assists with football, and then one guy with football, right? So, like, having an open-ended thing for sports men's a little hard to break down a silo because she's so damn busy. Like, it's – you have her sit down and talk about individual people for certain teams, it's damn near impossible, which I understand and I get that. Um, but, like, with my – we got a new volleyball coach. And he's freaking great, right? We, we meet a lot. His assistant's awesome. Like, we'll sit down. He'll, he asked me, like, hey, like, you know, for practices, we're trying to match the high-low thing. Like, what's that look for a low day? I don't know volleyball very well, but I'll kind of explain what a low day should look like in terms of, like, maybe basketball or a field sport, like football. 
or soccer, you know, um, like high day more for like, if I use basketball as an example, you know, more full court, 5v5, freaking get after it. Whereas, you know, low days can be more like the uh, three point in, you know, more technical, tactical type of deal, like small fetid, small drills. And he's like, oh, okay. And so, and then I'm like, you know, high days about an hour 45 or hour 30, low days, hour, hour 15. He sticks to those times like that. Like he, cause I mean, like, I think we know more of the physical side of athletics, whereas coaches know way more about the technical tactical aspect. And so, I mean, that's what our job is. We know the physical side. We take care of the physical side. You worry about the X's and O's, getting them in the right position. And he's been freaking awesome. And so is my women's basketball coaches too. They're really good about, they've been really good about it too, but like, he's been great. Like he cuts practice off at an hour 15, at an hour 45. There's no extra. It's like, oh, we're done. We're done. And we're done. And, you know, the girls are in good mood, like good moods are, our loads that I've been seeing, I've been consistent, you know, our low days are low, high days are high. I'm like, oh my God, this is perfect. You know, our injury report is tiny, you know, except for some kids that had surgeries and stuff like that, but it, our injury report's tiny. And so I'm really excited to kind of see what te- happens in season because he's been, we've been meeting and bouncing ideas off each other's brains about like, you know, where to structure stuff and how to structure it and put it. And I'm, I got a good feeling he's really going to implement it in a, a really good way to where our kids are fresh and ready to go. But um, so I do have some control, but again, not a lot of control over those other aspects. So it's, it's super tough. Like you said, it's really tough. That's good to see like a, a coach really embrace it and ask for feedback about how, how their programming and how their practices are going to match up with you. Cause no like you said, trying to get out of the silos or at least like maybe, maybe in some search situations, like what you mentioned with how many teams like sports medicine has, like it's hard for them to have much input outside of just the, this is what you need to know about my teams. I can't really mm-hmm. know what else is going on. Cause I have all these other competing priorities, but at least have an open line of communication like you do with yeah. like your new volleyball coach. I think that's that's crucial to at least starting to mend the gap between those two uh, different departments. And and that's yeah. that's a great start with uh, like talking about like giving your athletes a heads up to like a hard training session or a hard next phase. Like you mentioned before, mm-hmm. when you started implementing this stuff, how were you kind of prepping your athletes for hey this is what we're going to put into the program and then yeah. like how have you kind of educated them along the way because like you said you're not sure how you're going to do it with soccer and it's it's going to be a very different beast like basically tripling what your roster is going to be doing and trying to educate 45 guys and a whole staff of how to put this into a program so what was kind of your initial approach when you added this, like with your smaller teams and how have you throughout the process educated the athletes and kind of took it to the point it currently is? Yeah. Uh, you know, I, the, my other teams, like they're, it's just, I, I don't know, just talking with them really. It's just explaining, this is why we're doing, this is what I want to do. And this is why I'm doing it. Um, and just being really, uh, more precise yeah well just yeah just being really precise about what i'm what i want you to do and how this should work and how, about how it should work is how it's going to go um because it, i kind of got the idea well i mean it's kind of come from a leadership thing but like simon Sinek had a great thing on like the, the golden circle of like people don't buy what you do they buy why you do it so if i tell them my why and we're going to do it kind of this is how i want to do it and this is my my uh yeah, my why or like my goal or ambition for the program, you know, they have a little better buy into it, but uh, it's just it's really good communication. Like just telling them, Hey, like, and then figuring out like RPs and stuff. Like I'll show them a sheet. Like this is how it should feel. And then constantly looking at what, like, for example, with volleyball, they're giving me like threes and fours and so like really low RPs. I'm like, this is weird. Like practice is that easy. And I'm like, well, we thought like a 10 was, you know, like we were conditioning, like we did conditioning, like I got to get them ready for camp. We did like uh we had Tabata sprints, like, you know, uh, was it 15 yards down back, down back in 20 seconds, rest 10, just to get them 
prepared for like long, long rallies, which I look back at it now and I'm like, that's kind of stupid. But, um, cause I didn't really get lactic. I'm like, yeah. So anyways, um, and they're like, they thought that was what a 10 was. And I'm like, no, 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 no. It's not like, it's not how tired you are. It's just how much, like how hard do you push yourself? Like, I guess, I guess it was how tired you were to a degree, but you know, don't think of it as like a hard conditioning session. It's a little bit different. Um, it's just how hard did you exert yourself in practice? Like, did you play for 45 minutes? And at the end of it, you're like, Jesus, that was hard. That's like a 10, right? I told them like going five sets with a close, uh, close match points, like, you know, like the score of like, you know, 25 to 27 or something. You have five sets was really tight. That's like a 10. And they're like, oh, that makes sense. So it's, it's looking at stuff and then learning and then speaking in their language too. Like if I tell them like for basketball, I'm like a 10 is you get subbed out for a game. Let's say a game. You get subbed out twice and you play 80 to 90% of the time. That's a 10, right? Or if you get subbed out a couple more times, but you go to overtime and you play the entire overtime period. Like that's a 10. And they're like, oh, okay, that makes more sense. And then the weight room, like, okay, so a 10 would be the majority of your lifts, especially like main lifts, it's you're grinding them out. Like it's just, oh my God, that's heavy. And you grind it out throughout those heavy lifts. Like that's a 10 in here. I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So you, I educate them and kind of speak a language they understand. And then they can relate it back to, okay, that's what it was. Okay, this was like a five or a six. And then we started getting more like RPs that matched more of like what was happening. Like, okay, this is better. Um, but yeah, it's, it's just open communication and really explaining what I'm like, what, kind of what I'm looking for um, and what they should expect um, is how kind of I got that started. Um, and then the yeah, men's soccer is just going to be starting out like, this is the kind of things I want to implement and why I want to implement it for your benefit, yada, yada, yada. And then, you know, kind of slowly as they feel it out, and they understand it and gain more experience, then they can, um, then we can start utilizing those things more. Nice. I like it. That's a, I think that's a very good way to kind of do it and, and introduce it and get feedback. But it made me think of too, like how you explain the RP, like really putting it into their language. I think mm -hmm. people want to use it. They want to find a different way that's not percentages or not so rigid. And you want athletes feedback and like I was sitting here like jotting stuff down just thinking like how I could explain it a little bit better using RPEs like after mm -hmm. sessions like hey this is what a, a one RM like this is RPE for the weight room like this is where yep. one RM falls this is where like a testing set falls this is where like auxiliary work falls but then yep. conversely like all right this is on the soccer field this is like a tight like conference game this is overtime mm -hmm. this is where a 10 falls hey this yep. is like a what a, this is like a rondo's warm-up this is where this is like a three or four like you're just getting moving so even that too so they understand like how you respond to a stress or how you respond to an adaptation in a different area so they can start to kind of relate that in their head when they actually write it down I, I started yeah. thinking about that a little bit more. I like it. Yeah, exactly. It's, it's, you put it into their language to where they can best understand it. And then you're going to get a more accurate picture because like we don't have GPS or heart rate monitors. So I can't get a objective load. So as long as they can best relate it back to you, it's going to be a better tool to use. So yeah, it's just be yeah, finding a language that they understand and then they can go. And then yeah, like, as they do it more, they learn and learn like, okay, like, that makes sense. Okay. But yeah. Nice. Hey, so like any good training session, uh, yeah. we end the show with a good finisher. So okay. I got four quarters, four yep. questions, and a good old 10 RPE. So we got overtime at the end. Overtime. All right. All so right. We can go, you can, we can go rapid fire or you could take yep. your time on each one, but you ready? Yep. Fire away. All right. First one, biggest influence in the strength and conditioning profession and biggest influence in weightlifting? Ooh. Biggest influence in strength. Uh, that's, a, that's a lot of people on that one. Um, God dang. Um, biggest influence. 
and strength conditioning. Uh, hold on, I'll go weightlifting and I'll come back to that one. Weightlifting, Dmitry Klokov is probably my freaking biggest influence. The dude's a freaking monster. Like, was it, I think he was a 10, not 102, is it 105? Yeah, he was a 105 when the 105 category was around. But dude, he was just a freak. Like, he was, I love Klokov. It's just like how he, pro, like how he lifted, how he trained, just his intensity. And I don't know, that dude was awesome. So, um, influence in the strength conditioning field, like, I mean, there's a lot of people like my, like my boss really, she got me into it and she's a big influence on how, how I approach stuff. Um, God dang. Uh, he's like Joey Burgless. I think that's how you say his name. Like big influence on structure and how to do things in a tight time frame. You know, uh, I do train some youth kids. So like, uh, Michael's wife at BBA. Um, there's a lot of people to look up to. Uh, probably actually big. I don't think of it pop in my head, but like uh, like Nick DeMarco at Elon, kind of his structure and stuff. I mean, I really like what he's doing there, Elon, especially Jordan Newsma, uh, and then uh, Coach Braithway at Iowa um, taught me some really good things too um, when I was there as an intern. So those those are kind of my big biggest influence there's more uh, but those are the kind of ones i can think of right now i like it hey so when you're not coaching yep. or competing what are some of your hobbies that are unrelated to strength training and coaching uh well i do jujitsu so that's kind of not related so that's that's been a lot of that's been a lot of fun um been loving that uh so that's what i've been doing kind of as my hobby outside of training like weightlifting and kind of coaching even though it's still something physical, but uh, it's not weightlifting. So, um, but yeah, it's just it's freaking awesome. I love it. It's, it's so much fun. Like rolling. It's, you don't, it's crazy how like I'm, I think I weigh like 224. I'm pretty damn strong, but like I'll roll with a guy that's maybe 190 and he can, you know, do if you're in a certain position, certain technique, just flip me real quick, get me on my back real fast or just attack real quick. I'm like, Jesus, it's, it's it's a lot of fun and I yeah thoroughly enjoy it. Gi or no gi? Gi right now, yeah. I think my uh, our pro professor, um, but yeah, our professor. Um, I think after they'll let you after six months, they'll let you do no gi. So I'll try no gi out All for right. sure. I think that's I think that's more applicable to like the real world. You know, if I ever get into a situation where I have to defend myself, it's like if that's someone if someone doesn't have a jacket on, if they have just like a shirt and whatever it's like okay no gi would be applicable but anything else it's like yeah gi works but yeah gi nice hey so if you weren't involved in coaching what do you think you would be doing as a career and if you could pick up a sport that wasn't weightlifting you didn't get to do weightlifting what sport do you think you would have done like at this age uh or or you, if you could start it all over, if you could start it all over from the beginning and you got to pick, like, would you would have tried to go pro in jujitsu if you were like 12? No. Uh, oh, yeah, about 12? <laughs> oh, shit, but not weightlifting? Oh, okay. Um, probably rugby. I mean, I freaking love rugby. Rugby's, it was a close, it was a close second to football. I mean, I don't know. It might have been more fun than football, to be honest. I, I love rugby. It was great. Um, yeah, it definitely have to be rugby. Probably try to go pro in rugby or something like that. Do that. Um, or if like right now, if I didn't have weightlifting, like if I couldn't do weightlifting, I'd probably try to do rugby for older people. Yeah. What about a career? If you, if oh, you yeah, weren't career, in that's coaching. Right. Uh, God dang, that's it. A hard, I mean, I know I wouldn't want to be in a freaking cubicle. I wouldn't want to work in an office. I can't stand that. Like, I mean, obviously we work in offices, but it's not like nine to five, you're in your cubicle all damn day, and you have your lunch and your water coffee break. But uh hmm, probably a trade, if I think about it. Like I farmed for a summer and I drove a combine and a seed truck, like 18 wheeler big rig seed truck. <laughs> probably one of my favorite jobs I've ever had in my life. Don't know why. 
Oh, I do know why. It was I don't know. Just it was it was so much fun to drive a big rig around in and out of field, take it to the take it to the uh, the farm and you know dump it and then go back. Um, I don't know about I don't know if I'd be a farmer, but something in a trade like doing something where it's like there's an objective measure to your work, right? Where it's you know if you're I don't know, working HVAC like or something like that. It's like okay, I have to fix this thing or maintain this thing and get it back up and running. Okay, cool, I did that. Check that off. Check that off. Um, and you're not in an office all day, so probably something hands-on, probably manual labor to a degree, uh, but a trade for sure. All right. Hey, so if you're setting up an ideal training day where mm -hmm. maybe you don't have back like a lift group sandwiched on both sides, what's your go-to training music and best post-training meal? Ooh, uh, this is like a Saturday. Um, so it depends on the movement. Squats, it's Metallica, um, Sabbath True. That's my freaking heavy squat song. Uh, or just anything really Metallica, heavy like that. Uh, and then if it's just, or I have a playlist, it's called like Put Heavy Shit Over Your Head. Um, <laughs> I listen to that just with just any lift, but probably something heavy or depends on like EDM. So I listen to like Blauhouse, which is really good. I like those mixes. Um, and then post training meal. Ooh. I have a really freaking big burger with some sweet potato fries and a beer or like Hawaiian food like rice with like chicken chicken beef and rib with the mac salad yeah that's the, right. the, the go-to right there yeah nice not our big burger so all right last one I got for you for overtime yeah. What is the most valuable piece of advice you've received? And if you want to share from who? Oh, I want to piece of advice. And it doesn't have to be related to strength conditioning. Oh. Damn, that's a... I probably should have thought more about more about that one. Um, God, I have a piece of advice. I don't know. I don't know who said it or really get, but like it's it's kind of like a saying. Um, but I mean, I know people have told it to me before, but it's like if you do what you love, you never work a day in your life. So it's like basically find what you love to do. Actually, my grandpa told me that actually um, once um but yeah it's and i would say that to really anybody is i understand like i know that in the world we live in it's got to find a job got to work so you can live but it's if you can find what you do find what you love to do early and just pursue that in any way you possibly can monetarily so you can live but yeah do it yeah do what you love you know work a day in your life i love it no that's great advice i think anybody that's getting to this profession, you better really love it too, especially if we talk yeah. about finances and everything. So yeah. it, it makes it a lot easier when you're not getting some of that uh, compensation to at least enjoy going to work and really enjoy what you're doing on a day in day out basis. So definitely good advice. Hey, for anybody that's got any questions or follow up, um, kind of mm -hmm. want to pick your brain on anything we talked about today. How can they get in touch with you or follow you if they have any questions from the show? Yeah, you can follow me on the old Instagram. Um, I think it's Alec underscore Olson underscore strength coach. I think something like that. You just type my name, Alec Olson. It should pop up. And then if you want to follow kind of my weightlifting journey, it's AO underscore list. Um, or you can email me Olson AJ at W wou.edu uh, i'm not gonna publicly give out my phone number but um yeah if you want to reach out talk a little more if anyone wants to talk anymore or ask a follow-up if they're interested in anything i said so um yeah you know, i'm not on twitter i i'm not getting into that freaking shit show so i'm not even yeah not touching that so no i'm a uh i'm a twitter bystander just to see uh just to see what nonsense is going on and as soon as I've got enough for the day, I'm done. Yeah. Yeah. No. Hey, but I appreciate you coming on today. It was good to talk yes. with you a little bit more after our introduction Absolutely. at the conference. So 
it's yeah. uh it's been good we'll definitely have to keep in touch more but i can't thank you enough for, for sure. coming on and sharing with everybody no thank you i mean well quick before we leave just a shameless plug kind of a shameless plug um i learned a shit ton about what i know like continuing education stuff strengthcoachnetwork.com um it opens back up in december so if anyone is like oh i like that idea like where can i get ideas or just continue education for any coaches out there that's a freaking great one like i learned so much on that website but yeah great resource yeah. no doubt yeah massively great resource but yeah it was great be- it was great thanks for having me on i really appreciate it it was a really good time awesome man yeah i appreciate it thanks for coming on and uh we'll talk soon absolutely that's it for this episode of the strength game thank you again to this week's guest and to our sponsors be sure to connect and keep up with our guests at the links in the description below Remember to subscribe to us on Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast provider to stay up to date on all future episodes. Also, check us out on YouTube and CoachO'Brien.com, where you can find all the video versions of these episodes, as well as show notes, episode schedule, and much more. Comments, ratings, and reviews are always welcome and appreciated. Thanks again for tuning in, and be sure to join us next week for another great episode of The Strength Game.